Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Um, right, my name is Lee Hooper. I'm here to work the system. I've got 19 minutes to give you a little bit of an introduction to dehydration and then talk about assessing it, okay? Right, so a bit of introduction on what dehydration is, uh, how many older people get it, the effects of it on health, and why older people get it so often. Um, and a little bit then moving into guidelines about how we know how much people should drink each day and how to assess dehydration, how to know whether someone is dehydrated or not. Sorry, keep pressing the wrong thing. So water is important. 60% of our body weight is water. A bit more when we're born, a bit less as we get older, but a huge amount. Dehydration covers several distinct conditions. The one that we're going to be talking about is the one where it relates to not drinking enough. And that's called low intake or intracellular dehydration. And what happens in intracellular dehydration is that because we drink too little, our body contains too little fluid, but the same amount of electrolytes as usual. And that means our fluid is more concentrated, okay? And that's equivalent to a rise in serum osmolality. That's what that rise is. That Concentration means that fluid moves out of our cells into our extracellular circulation. So the consequence of not drinking enough is that our cells shrink and function a little bit less well. The other sort of dehydration is when you have diarrhea or vomiting or hemorrhage and you lose both fluid and electrolytes, and then you lose fluid mostly from your extracircular circulation. And that has very different effects on your health. Okay, so they're very different conditions. So insufficient drinking, or low fluid intake, leads to low intake dehydration, and that's characterized by raised serum osmolality. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So how many older people are dehydrated? These are some of the samples that we're doing, uh, that we found in a systematic review looking at the prevalence of dehydration. And you'll see it runs from about 16% in New Zealand inpatients to about 58% in hospital, patients admitted to hospital in Poland. These are all older adults. So even at the bottom of that range, 16%, that's one in every six older adults has low intake dehydration. It's a huge number, okay? So it's a really, really big issue. It clearly depends a little bit on medical health. It depends on frailty and, and age, but and probably also cultural issues too. So it varies between samples, but all of the samples have really high levels of dehydration in older adults. We don't know that much about dehydration in dysphagia. I can't find any serum osmolality data, which is equivalent to the data I just showed you. But I found four studies that give us some indication. They measured van creatinine ratio, uh, the first two, and they tell us that between 25 and 30% of older adults with dysphagia are probably dehydrated. Now, van creatinine is not a brilliant measure in older adults of dehydration, but it gives us a clue as to what's going on. All of these four studies also looked at fluid intake. And again, I'll discuss why fluid intake isn't a terribly good measure. But what you'll see is that all of those intakes are very low. All of them are below 1.5 liters a day for our older people. So suggestion that with dysphagia, we certainly have low fluid intakes, and we likely have quite high levels of dehydration. This is a study I'm sure you're aware of, Robbins 2008. They randomized 515 patients with dementia or Parkinson's and aspiration to either drinking liquids with a chin down posture or thickened liquids. And they found very similar levels of pneumonia or pneumonia and death in those two groups. But what you do see as a difference is dehydration levels. What you see here is that dehydration levels seem to be a little bit higher in the thickened liquid group than the chin down group. That's supported by the UTI data. It's not good data because dehydration was diagnosed by the individual physicians. It wasn't blinded. And also, individual physician diagnosis is a little bit random. So it's not brilliant data, but it does suggest there may be some increased risk when we've got thick fluids. Okay, these are two systematic reviews looking at the effects of dehydration on health. The first one uh, looks at, uh, all of them in older adults, by the way. I'm not always saying older adults, but it's always referring to older adults. So they're finding that those who are dehydrated have higher levels of mortality, frailty, bradyarrhythmia, TIA, oral health and surgery recovery were poorer, duration of hospital stay was longer, neurocognitive function may be impaired. So quite nasty outcomes from being dehydrated. 
our own systematic review has looked at um, the risk of mortality in older adults with pneumonia. And if you have dehydration alongside your pneumonia, your odds of mortality in the next 30 days are more than doubled. Okay? So there's some really big health impacts from dehydration. And it's common in older adults. Why? Why is it so common? Well, our human's usual response to drinking too little, what you'll definitely see in children, see in most adults, but not so much in older adults, is that with that serum osmolality rise, it triggers osmoreceptors in your brain to trigger thirst. Okay? So we should be thirsty. That means we drink more. We correct the problem. The other thing that happens is it triggers our kidneys to conserve fluid better. And that means that we lose less fluid, okay? So we conserve our fluid. The trouble is in older adults, thirst doesn't get triggered, so we don't get thirst in the same way. And kidney function is decreased, and therefore that concentration doesn't happen. So that exacerbates our losses. We don't correct the problem. Um, on top of that, diuretics and laxatives may exacerbate losses, and a smaller proportion of our fluid, of our body, is fluid in older adults. So we have less of a buffer against dehydration too. Additionally, a whole another range of factors are that people may choose to reduce their fluid intake, often because they want to avoid visiting the toilet and as a response to worries about continence. Dementia may mean that people forget to drink or think they have drunk when they haven't. Reduced social contact reduces social drinking. That's really important both to keep people socially connected but also to keep them hydrated. And physical access may be limited in a variety of different ways as we get frailer. On top of that, there's a whole bunch of institutional factors that I'm not going to mention, but there are different layers here. So what's the effect of dysphagia then? Well, we all know that coughing or choking when drinking can make people nervous about drinking. Okay? So that's one of the first mechanisms, I think. There has been a theory that thickening of drinks combined water and reduce absorption of fluid from drinks. But actually, there's been some good research by Citro and colleagues that suggests that's not the case. Thickened liquids hydrate you just as well as any other liquids. Okay? But thickened fluids are less likely to quench our thirst, they uh, release flavours poorly, and they may have impaired texture. So people may be less interested in drinking just because of the thickening. Okay, so what are we recommending then? How much should older people drink? Well, we've got two sets of guidelines in Europe. The first is the ESPEN Clinical Nutrition and Hydration in Geriatrics. The second is the European Food Safety Authority, and they tell us the same thing. They tell us that in older men, we should, that older men should drink at least two liters of drinks a day, and that's on top of the fluid they get from food. And older women should drink at least 1.6 liters a day, again, on top of what they get from food. So that's very clear, and it's what we should be making sure. And, and I think working with older adults, it's really clear that if you want people to drink that much, you've got to offer them, give them a lot more than that. The American guidelines are quite confusing. They have two contradictory guidelines which both relate to older adults. I'm going to just move on quite swiftly. I'm not quite sure how they pull those two together. Okay, so how do we diagnose dehydration? Let's move on to that because it's really important. The primary indicator of low intake dehydration is plasma or serum osmolality. Okay? And that is a blood test followed by centrifugation, followed by measuring the freezing point of your plasma. Or, or your serum, okay? It's quite complex, requires a lot of lab time. So it's a difficult test. The people in my local lab cringe when they see me coming, can I say. It's, it's uh, not something they love doing. So how can we diagnose low intake dehydration? Um, so, I mean, we can use serum osmolality, but given that that's complicated, how can we do it in a simple way? So several other measures are possible. Bun creatinine ratio I've mentioned already is a good indicator of hydration when renal status is good. But the trouble is, in many of our older adults, it's not. And we can't disentangle the, re the results around renal factors compared to dehydration factors. So it's, it's quite confounded. Low fluid intake is a good way, but individual needs can, may be variable. And also, assessment of fluid intake is awful. If you look at the literature, it's incredible how badly we do it. Physician assessment is possible, but again, the problem with physician assessment is every physician uses their own criteria, and if you get a group of 100 older people, different physicians will choose different older people out of that pool as being dehydrated, so it's not reliable. Another way is looking at weight fluctuations, but there's been some really good recent research looking at weight fluctuations in well-hydrated older adults, 
and they find that there are quite big weight fluctuations regardless of hydration. So actually, it's not such a good measure of hydration. So can we use some of those the, the, the sort of basic physiological mechanisms that we know go along with hydration to help us identify? So can we use thirst? Can we use some of the factors associated with reduced fluid excretion or reductions in cell volume or low blood volume to help us identify dehydration? So we came at this by carrying out both a systematic review and also some primary research. The primary research was with 188 older adults living in long-term care in the UK. And our objective was to determine the diagnostic accuracy of signs used in screening tests for detecting low intake dehydration. All of our participants were over 65. So I'm going to go through these quite briefly. First, doesn't work, sadly, in older adults. This is the, the box plot I'm showing you is the serum osmolality of older adults in care who said they were thirsty compared to saying they were not thirsty a couple of minutes before their blood test. Okay, so very close time proximity. And as you see, serum osmolality is almost exactly the same. So there's no different in hydration status between those two groups. And that's true in all the other studies we found too. Dark urine. I don't know about you, but I see on the back of toilet doors, it tells you to look and see the color of your urine to see whether you're drinking enough. Does that work in older adults? Well, no, it doesn't. This is um, a, a rock plot, and that diagonal line is the line of no effect. If you were looking at a good diagnostic uh, technique, what you'll see is that line going up into the top left-hand corner and coming back again. We're not seeing that here at all. So the area under the curve is 0.51. No effect is 0.5. There is nothing going on here. We can't use dark urine. Urine-specific gravity moves away from the line of no effect a little bit, but its accuracy is still far too low. So the area under the curve is still less than 0.6, which is just not accurate enough. And that's true from a whole bunch of studies, not just ours. We looked at lots of measures of how you assess dry mucous membranes, um, both in our primary research and the systematic review, and none of them worked well. Poor skin turgor, which is just taking a sort of snap of your skin and seeing how fast it relaxes back. Again, good idea, but actually it seems to reflect skin aging rather than hydration status, unfortunately, as in our older adults. Sunken eyes, fever, confusion, cognitive function, we looked at all of those and none of those worked either. So unfortunately, although it would be lovely to be able to use some of those simple signs, none of them actually are usefully diagnostic, single measures of low intake dehydration in older adults. They don't work. What does work? Well, calculated osmolarity works. So we've been talking about the, the, the gold standard being measured osmolality, looking at the freezing point of a, ser a serum sample but you can calculate to estimate the osmolarity. So if you take the results for sodium, potassium, glucose, and urea in your blood, you can do that. And so we looked at it, five different big European co cohorts of older adults, very different um, stages, some of them living at home, some of them in hospitals, some of them long-term care, different levels of illness. We checked out 39 osmolarity equations. Everybody uses a different osmolarity equation. And we found there is one that works, but only one. Okay, that is the one that you can see on the screen, the kajiria kran equation. And if you use that, it gives you a reasonably good estimate of actually measured osmolality. <clears throat> but you need to use a cut point of 295. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the guidelines, the ESPEN guidelines. Um, they've got lots more in them than I'm telling you, and they've also got lots of background material and references if you want to go into this in more detail. I'm being very brief. Okay, so one part of the guideline, all older persons should be screened for low intake dehydration when they contact the healthcare system if the clinical condition changes unexpectedly and periodically when malnourished or at risk of malnutrition. And I would say that should include when people are assessed for dysphagia or when they're found to have dysphagia and are treated for it. Directly measured serial plasma osmolality should be used to identify low intake dehydration in older adults. And the cut point for that is greater than 300. So if you're doing the directly measured, the cut point is greater than 300. The other thing you can do is use that specific serum osmolarity equation, the kajiria kwan equation. And if you use that, the cut point is actually slightly different at 295. Older persons and their informal carers may use appropriate tools to assess fluid intake, but don't rely on them. Also check whether people are dehydrated. Okay? Simple signs and tests, such as skin turgor, mouth dryness, weight change, urine color, specific gravity, should not be used. They're not good enough. The same is true of bioelectrical impedance. 
Okay, there is one possible new screening tool on the horizon, just to, to alert you to it, but it's not good enough to use yet. This was um, based on the geriatric dehydration screening tool. Um, they assessed 299 hospitalized older adults with good cognition, and they found it didn't work terribly well. So they rejigged it, they produced a new tool with only nine questions, and the nine question version seems to work relatively well in over 75s, but this is quite a select group. We're talking over 75s with good cognition. We still don't have a tool for those with less good cognition, and we still don't have a tool here with the 65 to 74 years, but at least we've got something that's looking positive. Before it's used, we have to try it out on another population. That's not been done yet, but it's looking promising, so one to watch out for. It'd be great if that comes through. Okay, so I want to summarize, thank you for your listening. Water is essential to our bodies. Low intake dehydration is common and it increases our risk of health problems. Older adults are at risk of drinking too little for a variety of reasons, and that means it's complex to sort it all out. You'll hear a bit more about that in the next talk. We need to monitor hydration status in older adults, including those with dysphagia. And monitoring should be via serum osmolality or using the calculated osmolarity equation that works. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much to my collaborators, our funders over the years, to all the people who've worked with us in our primary studies. Some of them have been just the most delightful people. I want to say thank you to Nestle too for inviting me. And I also need to say, because of my WHO contacts, that I haven't been funded by Nestle for my travel, my accommodation, um, or indeed uh, paying the fee. Okay, thank you very much for your time.